Amen. And all God's people said. That song, uh, gosh, it's probably 50 years, about 50 years old. And takes us back to the 70s. And uh, Terry, you were like 40 when you first heard it, weren't you? Something like that. Sing that. We used to sing that song and you know, with our leisure suits and our bell bottoms and uh, sitting around a campfire and uh, pass it on. It only takes a spark. Keep a fire going. And, uh, Suzanne, we appreciate you and uh, thankful. Appreciate our student choir. They were here at 8 o'clock and uh, they remained with us uh, during this time. And Several of them are going to be traveling up to Birmingham Children's Hospital, uh, one of their Dear friends, a student there, uh, Alex Martin, is, it appears that he's been diagnosed with uh, a type of cancer, uh, lymphoma or leukemia. They'll know in the next day or so, they have to do a bone marrow uh, test. But uh, Alex is a senior at Borgard High School, and, and certainly our thoughts are with him today, and we're praying for him. It, uh, it's... it's stunning how quickly life can change for any and for all and so I know that you'll join with me in praying for Alex and one of our one of our dear older adults uh, Miss Kate Atchison um, resident monarch um, she is a retired librarian and a member of the uh, four children's library team that uh, we're working on with regards to the uh, the caboose and moving that over on the other side of the memorial to, uh, as a library for, uh, for children, a memorial for the four children that died in the tornado. And Miss Kay was diagnosed with cancer here a few weeks ago, and they did a very major surgery on her a few days ago, and she has not responded well to that. In fact, uh, the family has been called in uh, as just a little while ago. I got word about that, so... I want us to be praying for Miss Kay Atchison and also for uh, Alex Martin, especially. And there are others, but uh, but right now, let, I just want you to join your heart with mine and, and let us pray for these together, okay? Lord, uh, pain and suffering and struggle is uh, no stranger to youth or to adults. And Especially here this morning, we think of Alex, and we pray for him for his healing, Lord, and well-being. God, we pray for intervention that somehow, some way, that uh, perhaps, and we would longingly love to hear that it's not a type of cancer, Lord, but uh, we do pray for healing, a divine touch for him, and certainly that you might bless the hands and hearts of those that minister to him. And we thank you for Miss Kay, and we thank you for the for the way that she has been such an encourager to us, to our church and our community, and especially with regards to the memory of those children that died uh, back in March of 2019. And God, how we pray for an intervention in her life at this moment, if it could be found within your will, that you might grant healing. And, and Lord, uh, even though she's in a, a state of consciousness that it seems like that she can't hear or relate, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you just might give her a peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, we just lift them both up to you, Alex and Kay. And, and there are others, Lord. Uh, we, we know that uh, a number of people going through tough times right now, whether it's Bill or Marcia or, or Robert, uh, Lord, or Kathy or Barbara, he, he, all of these folk, God, who are struggling right now with health challenges. And as a church family, this is a sacred moment and responsibility that we have to, to pray for each other, to encourage each other in times like this. So, Lord, uh, thank you for hearing our prayer, and thank you, Father, for always being there for us. And, and we're just grateful that uh, we can take this time to, to lift up one another in such a way that it, uh, we pray for healing, but also that it honors you and glorifies you. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say Amen. You know, sometimes in moments like this, you, you realize um, how, uh, how vulnerable we all are and uh, the difficulties of life. I, I, it was just, uh, what, a couple of weeks ago, Miss Kay 
was working the uh, outside here with the families and folk who were coming through our health mission and and she was uh, greeting folk and smiling and uh, just uh, having a, a really uh, a great impression upon folk and then then all of a sudden a diagnosis comes out a surgery comes forth and and in her condition at this point uh, uh, it's it has changed so drastically and and the same with regards to Alex, with regards to being a high school senior at Borgard, and things they've been going clicking along pretty good clip here, and uh, and then all of a sudden something happens and changes at that moment, and and uh, life literally really does change on a dime. And others, and as I look around this gathering here, I know that we've had a number of people, family members who have passed before us, and our lives have been changed in a profound way. Yet, you know, we talked about last Sunday that uh, while things are changing around us, uh, that our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it is really a moment in time when we just need to focus upon the basic aspects of our faith as to who we are, what we're about, and where we're going in life itself. But I was thinking over the past uh, several days with regards to Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I was thinking about, and when I thought about that, I thought about what John, John the Baptist said when he looked up and saw his cousin coming toward him there at the River Jordan. And all of a sudden, spontaneously, I believe inspired by the Holy Spirit, he just shouted out, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And it is that phrase, the Lamb of God, that I begin to focus upon and think about with regards to the significance of that. So I want us to, I'm, I'm planning to preach from Genesis to Revelation, okay? In the remaining four and a half hours that I've got. <laughs> but it really does begin in the book of Genesis when you think about it, when you begin to look in the scripture. In fact, I want you to turn with me to the 22nd chapter of Genesis, and I'm not going to read all the way through, clearly. But in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 8, there's the story of... Uh, Abraham and Isaac, a father and his son. Now, you got to go back, and I, I think that I speak to folk who have got an understanding of Scripture and biblical knowledge. And you had Abraham and Sarah, who were up in age and had passed those childbearing age, that childbearing age, which, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on up there. I mean, they probably were hitting the 80s and 90s, somewhere in there. But God had promised to Abraham and Sarah that he would give them a son. And they had gotten up to that point where they were past that. And they were getting, you know, obviously it was like this isn't going to happen from that standpoint in their mind and their heart. But, but then God blessed them with a son. His name was Isaac. And so you got Abraham, you got Sarah, you got Isaac. You got a very special child, a special child, a gift from God, promised by God, promised by God. And then all of a sudden at this moment in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, God tests. And I want to say something real quick here. God does not tempt, he tests us, okay? It's a test. I remember in seminary with you know, Dr. Ray Robbins, who's been in, Ray Frank Robbins has been in our church, but he's now gone on to be glory and glory itself. But you go into class, you sit down, and he said, take out a half sheet of paper, and uh, we'd have a pop test. And it seemed like every time, every time that Tuesday through Friday, there'd be a, a pop test that would take place. And, but God tests us with regards to our commitment, our loyalty, our faithfulness to him in that sense. He doesn't tempt us. He tests us. And at this particular moment, and I, I think it's a vulnerable moment. I, when I look at it, if I put myself in Abraham's position here, or see, it's his, his sandals, not his shoes. I, I would be uh, t totally unnerved at this moment when I look at it myself. I'm being quite transparent here. Which, by the way, is a word that's not really followed much this day and time. But look at verse, 20, verse 1 of the 22nd chapter. So, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, he called him by name, knows it. And, and by the way, he knows your name. He knows my name. He, he knows us, our name. I think about that in, in the context of like on the Mount of Transfiguration when you've got uh, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus up there, and they're, you know, they're, they're praising God, worshiping, and all of a sudden the heavens open up, and Moses and Elijah come down, and, and Peter, James, and John look around and say, well, who are these guys? You know, Google them real quick. No, they knew who they were by name. When we get into glory itself, we'll know everybody by name, and they'll know us. Thank God for that. No mystery. 
When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, Now we know in part, but soon we shall know, even as what? We are known. Even as we are known. Abraham, God called his name. One day he's going to call our name too, cross over that river into his very presence. Maybe a fair question to ask at this moment is, will we be ready in that? So he said, Abraham, what did Abraham say? He said, I, he said here am I. I think, I think there's a great sermon series. I'm not going to get into it right now. But, but those moments in Scripture where, like Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Here am I. Which speaks volumes because it speaks of someone who is, who is willing to open up their life completely. Here I am. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not hiding from you. But here I am. It's a little different because when you begin to read in the first few chapters of Genesis, when God came and he called the name of Adam and Eve, what, did they, you know, what happened there? They were hiding out. They were hiding out. They were ashamed with regards to what was going on. But Abraham wasn't ashamed. And when God called his name, he said, here I am. It's me. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Look at this with me a little further. Verse 2, he said, then he said, speaking of God, then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on, on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. When I, when, I, when I read that and, and looked at it and focused upon it, this is, this is really a preview of a hill called Calvary, when you think about it. Amen, Brother Gary? This, this is a preview of, of what's going to take place centuries from that point with regards to not an Abraham and an Isaac, but a, but a heavenly father and his son that would be on another hill, a hill called Calvary. The fire would be the anger of the people. The wood would be the, the cross, the old rugged cross. The sacrifice would be Jesus, the Lamb of God. So here we have this image, this preview of Calvary. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. I, I think I read in the book, did it not say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Take now your son, your, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. You know what I find amazing about this is that Abraham, as he's being tested, that he takes God at his word. No if, no ands, no buts. Now, when I, hold on, whoa, 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 you promised me a son. You didn't say anything about taking him and offering him up as a sacrifice. He just took God at his word. You know, sometimes in your life and my life, that's all we can do is just take God at his word. To go where we don't know where we're going, but we're being sent or led by him to go, to trust him like that. It says in verse 3 that Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him, two servants, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. And, and he rose and went to the place of which God had told him, that split wood, which reminds me of, a, of an old rugged cross that was used for the sacrifice. Verse 4 says, then on the third day, I think there's something to be said for the third day, the third day. You see, when I, when I talk about the preview of, uh, of, of, a, of a Calvary, when I talk about that, I'm talking about also a preview of the third day because it was on the third day that he, that he arose by the power of God, Jesus. So on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off and Abraham said to his young men, you stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship. You got that far? You with me on that far? You guys stay here. My son and I will go yonder and worship. You know, uh, I, they, these were southern boys because when you use the word yonder, it's like over here and over there. You know, it's, it's yonder. But, but look what else he said. And this is, a, this is really a, a, a glimpse of, of the heart and the faith of Abraham. And we will come back to you. Did you see that? Okay, a Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, and I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice, but, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you the place where it's going to happen. And Abraham turns around and said, okay, we're going to go, we're going to do this. And then he turns to those guys, he didn't lie to him, he said, hey, and we will come back to you. Not I will come back to you, but we will come back to you. That kind of faith. 
You see, Abraham believed that even if he did lay down the life of his son, that God was able to pick it back up again. And is that not a picture of a Calvary? Is that not a picture of a resurrection? That the Father who allowed His Son to die on the cross for us, knowing full well, Jesus knowing full well, that if He laid down His life, the Father would pick it back up again. That's the basis of our faith. Basis of our faith. We will come back to you. You know, that back to you is the, I, I think about that in the context of the angels and, the, and with, with the ascension that took place in that 40 day, that end of that 40 day window after the resurrection. The, the angels looked at the disciples as they watched the Lord go up into glory itself. He said, this same Jesus who you see going shall so come in like manner as you see. He's coming back to you. I said, the Lord's coming back for us. He's coming back for us. Look at verse 6. So Abraham, he, he took the wood of the burnt offering. He, he laid it on Isaac, his son, on the back. Now think about this. When I talk about the preview, the, the preview of Calvary, Jesus bore his cross. Isaac is, in the context of the moment here, about to be sacrificed. He's carrying his own wood, firewood. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But, but Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and says, My father, exclamation point, Dad. And Abraham said, Here I am, son. Here I am, my son. So Isaac looks at him and said this. Looked at him and said this. Look, the fire. The wood. But where's the lamb? Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Where's the lamb? So, so Isaac is carrying the wood that would be burned. Abraham's carrying the knife that would take the life away. And Isaac looks around and says, where's, where's the lamb? Sacrifice. I don't, I don't know if we can really get the sense of that moment, or maybe we could position ourselves way back then in that setting. Maybe not, you know, just kind of on the edge there, or maybe as a father or a parent, if we can really sense the, brev the, the weight of that moment emotionally. When Abraham is there and he's looking around and he knows what God has said, that Isaac is the sacrifice, and Isaac says, Dad, where's, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? They, you can read the rest of the story in Genesis 22 where, where they, they, they made the, the, the altar and, 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 and Abraham took Isaac and he bound him, tied him up and he laid him up on it. And, and it says that he reached for the knife and he was pulling the knife back. And, and the angel in glory shouted, Abraham, Abraham, ho, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I don't want you to take his life. And then suddenly there's a rustling in the thicket over there and there's a bull or a bullock that's over there, a ram, a ram that's over there whose horns have gotten caught up in the thicket and, and, and the angel of God says, uh, you, you can sacrifice that ram. And I, I look at that and I think because God is testing him. And I, and I believe in my own heart that in many of us with the day and, and the day in which we live in our society as the, the children of God, that we are being tested with regards to our faithfulness, our willingness to trust him. Abraham believed that as surely as he laid down the life that the father would pick it back up again. What I'm saying here is and what I see is that Abraham took God at his word. I don't know if we're prepared to take God at his word today. Particularly when it says, as they persecute, Jesus said, when they persecuted me, they will persecute you. In the world, you'll have tribulation, but cheer up, I've overcome the world from that standpoint. I don't know if we're prepared for that. Do you? Maybe I'm missing something. 
we get uh, we get a little, you know we get a little uptight sometimes with regards to people thinking that uh, you know we're, we're reading the Bible or we're going to church or all those kinds of things. What are you religious folk or what are you some you know kind of you know elitist or are you some type of uh, uh, someone who is totally sold out or are we really committed to our Lord to the point that we don't really care about the world thinks we're just committed to God that we take God at His word? Are we? But I go back. I go back to that question, where's the lamb? All right, well, well turn with me to John chapter, chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 29 through 31. So here we go from the Old Testament all the way. You know, the question has always been, where's the lamb? There's a, there's a couple other places in there, obviously, when it talks about the sacrifice. Now, it would be at that moment whenever, you know, uh, Pharaoh had the children of Israel, you know, hemmed up, and, and he had them locked down, basically, and, and Moses goes in and says, let my people go, but the I am has sent me, and, and Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then it says that God hardened his heart, and then, they, then God told Moses, you go tell everybody to sacrifice, take the blood of the sacrifice, and put it on the lintel of the door, and when the angel of death passes over, what? When I see the blood, what? I'll pass over you. Sacrifice. And then the priest would offer up the sacrifices with regards to the lambs in that sense. So the question is, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? So we go from the Old Testament to the New Testament here. Look at verse 29. The next day, chapter 1 of John. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God. Isaac asked the question. John answered the question. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's two descriptions here, and, and I don't want you to miss this. The, the Lamb of God is the, uh, is the Passover Lamb. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. The Lamb of God. But, but then there is this sacrifice of who takes away the sin of the world. That's the scapegoat. In fact, let, let me just bring us a little up speed here. On the, on the, the, the Day of Atonement... In Jewish history, on the Day of Atonement, they would bring two, two goats before the high priest, and they would, be, they would cast lots. One of them would be the scapegoat, and the other would be the sacrificial goat. So, so what the high priest would do, he would take his hands, and he would place it upon the, the scapegoat, and he would confess all of the sins of the people for that previous year. He would confess it on it, as in laying it on him. You, know, you, ever, you ever have any friends that said, when you're talking to them, lay it on me? Well, this is laying it on you, right here. Let no hold bar. Tell, put the whole story on that scapegoat. And after that confession has been made on the scapegoat, they would lead that goat out to the edge of the city. Sometimes they would take it and run it off a cliff because they didn't want it wandering back in. But it was a symbol of, of the, one who, the, the goat, that, or I should say the sacrifice, that takes away the sins of the world, the people. And the other one was sacrificed. The blood offering, where the high priest would go behind the veil of the temple into the Holy of Holies to the Ark of the Covenant that was there and, and the mercy seat which was symbolic there in the center of that Ark of the Covenant and he would take that container of blood and he would begin to sprinkle it around like seven times and then he would pour it on the mercy seat as a symbol of the covering of the sins of the people for another year. But thank God Almighty that when Jesus' blood was shed for you and I, it wasn't to cover our sins, but it was to wash us and make us white as snow. Thank God for that. What can, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Christ himself. What can enable me to be at peace with God? Nothing but the blood of Christ in that sense. So John, John, this is his cousin coming down to him, okay? It's not like he doesn't know him. But at that moment, the spontaneity of the Holy Spirit says, Look, the Lamb of God in response to the question of Isaac. Where is the Lamb? This is the Lamb of God. This is the one we've been looking for. That no longer will we have to go once a year to, to try to find out atonement. To, atonement is a word which simply means to be at one with God at that moment. To be one with Him. But now we can be at one with God for all of eternity. Because of the shed blood of Christ. So John says, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the word world there speaks of all the ugly of the world. I mean all the crud of the world. 
all the sin of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. John three sixteen and 17. But notice this. Look at verse 30. This is, this is more intriguing too. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me. This is why John later on would say about Jesus, his cousin, he must increase and I must decrease. John was popular. He was a popular preacher, evangelist. He was preaching repentance. And he was down by the River Jordan. He was baptizing, which was symbolic of cleansing and also symbolic of dedication and loyalty. John was doing that. People were responding from all over. The proselytes, all that was taking place during that time. But here at this moment, John says, this is someone who will be preferred before me. As in making a greater difference than I'm making, he says, in his mind, in his heart. But then there's this intriguing thought here. Notice this. For he was before me. Now, first of all, John was born before Jesus was born. You know that, don't you? I mean, when... when when you look at the, the lineage there and understand that, that John was, was born before Christ, and so when he says here that he was before me, what he's talking about is the pre-existence of Christ. Christ always has been. We talked about it last Sunday. Remember, this, was on, this will be on the test. Jesus, what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. So John is saying, he's got, it's a great theological truth here, the pre-existence of Christ. Christ always has been. This is the one that stepped out on the edge of nothing and spoke the world into being. He always has been. Always. He was before me. And then he said this. I did not know him. Now he did. But the, the, the word there is a word which means I didn't know what he was. As in I didn't really know who he was. I didn't realize that he was and is and always will be the Son of God. I didn't know that he is the Lamb of God, Savior of the world. That was what we would call an epiphany moment for him, for John. You know, John's like us. He had those moments too. That, the, you know, when he, you know, he, he called him out and light him up whenever it came down to, to saying, hey, what you're doing, and he was talking about a leader in government at that time. He said, what you're doing is wrong. And that leader in government took him and put him in jail or put him in the dungeon, kept him down there. John sent word through his, uh, through his disciples to the disciples. And Jesus said, are you the one that we should be looking for or should we look for another? He had his moments of doubt and despair too, just like we do. And what did Jesus say? He said, you go back and tell John everything running right on schedule. I got news for you. When we look at this whole world today, everything is running right on schedule. Everything running right on schedule. I didn't know what he was. But that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. But Jesus came baptizing with the Holy Spirit in that sense too. So the question in Genesis, where's the Lamb? John responds in the first chapter of John's Gospel, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But it doesn't stop there. Remember I talked about preaching from Genesis to Revelation? Look in Revelation. Look at the fifth chapter. See, I just heard sighs of relief right there. I, I, I expect there's probably not 45 more minutes left here. Revelation 5, verse 8. When he had taken this, this is, listen, this is, this is that moment when, when God pulls the curtain back. Mm. I, I tell you, there's those moments in your life and my life when we just have to sit down and say, Lord, pull that curtain back because I need a little, little bit more encouragement right here in this old world. I, I need to know that the best is yet to come. I need to know about that land of no mores. You know, no more cancer, no more, no more strokes, no more, no more hospitals, no more funeral homes, no offense. None of those kinds of things. I, I need to know, and, and I need to read that 21st chapter where it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea as in separation. And I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride for adorn for her husband. And Hey, that's what those flowers are about there, you know, just remembering those great marriages, 58 years and 53 years, sitting back there toward the back. 
seeing the bride of Christ come forth and the celebration of marriage and, and wholesomeness and loyalty and love and all those kinds of things. And the, there's no more dying and no more struggles, no more pain, no more sin, no more, no more, no more, no more. Don't you want to hear that? I mean, you would, you would actually... Um, if I told you, every, you know, if I told you everything that, 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 that I had encountered over the last 10 days, you think, is there any good news out there? Is there any good news? Any good news? Sometimes you just need that moment when God pulls the curtain back and you say, you know, I know where I'm going. I know how it's going to be. It's going to be okay. And you keep plugging along. Keep plugging along. Look what he says here. So if God pulls the curtain back. Look, look, at the, uh, look at the emphasis here. When, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, and, and by the way, apocalyptic literature, there's symbolism, it's, it's all symbolic in that sense. Four living creatures, representing four corners of the earth, and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. The lamb, the lamb. This is, this is basic. The, the lamb doesn't change. The lamb each having a harp and golden bowls of full of incense, which are the, oh, listen to this, which are the prayers of the saints. It's not a prayer that you pray that God doesn't remember and recall and provide still have for us. Did you know that? I got, I got cards and letters that of 50 years of ministry, and I'm st still hanging on to them from that standpoint. And every now and then I get in those big old boxes, you know, and and look through there and read some of the you know some of the thoughts from whether it was a Mount Sterling or a Camellia or a Crestview or or a Garden City or whatever. And you know, it's like strolling through pictures and those memories that come back to you. God has the prayers that you and I have prayed, and He's holding on to them. He's holding on to them. He remembers us. Prayers of the saints. Saints are those who let the light who let the light shine through. Those who have a personal relationship with the living God through His Son. Jesus Christ. And they sang a new song. New song. That would be a name of a good uh, contemporary gospel group if they ever thought about it. You, you are worthy. That's back to the 70s too, I think. But um, you, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, talking about the Lamb. And you have redeemed us to God Look, redeemed us to God by your blood. Not by your good works, but by your blood. The, the, the blood, the, it's, the, it's the symbol of the life that's poured out for us. No, no, no redemption without the shedding of blood. No, 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 no crown without a cross. You've redeemed us to God by your blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. It had to happen. It had to take place on the hill called Calvary. Isaac was a, was a preview of what would take place in, a, in the city of Jerusalem whenever our Lord would bear his own cross to a hill called Calvary and would allow his life to be taken. The angel cried from the bushes in, in Isaac with Isaac and Abraham, but he could have called 10,000 angels, but he chose not to for you and me. Shedding of the blood. I'm talking about your Savior who didn't have to die for us, but he did. He went through it all for us, for each of us. Redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, having made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. That's why that new heaven and new earth come into play. Then I looked, look, listen to this. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the numbers of them were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You can't count all of these. The redeemed of the Lord who gather and begin to shout, and they were saying with a loud voice in unison, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, exclamation point. And every creature, look at this, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Ever and ever and ever, he is worthy of our praise. The Lamb of God, Jesus, 
the one who gave his life for each of us. Thank God Almighty that there is this one who did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Thank God Almighty that, that, that our relationship with God is not complicated. That there is this moment when we can have that understanding that this is the one who died for us, who gave his life for us, that he's the Lamb of God, that enables us to be at one with him. The atonement, to be at one with him. To have peace with God. Our sins are forgiven. To have the peace of God. Not, not with, uh, with regards to uneasiness, knowing that guilt and all those kinds of things, but realizing that there's one who has washed us as white as snow from that standpoint. What was it that the, the, the student choir was singing? Nothing can bring me peace with God. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. His sacrifice for us. Peace with God enables us to have the peace of God, and that enables us to be at peace with each other. And let me tell you something, church. That's a key factor when it comes to a time of revival and renewal, to be at peace with each other. And if we're not at peace with each other, it's because we don't have the peace of God. And it's probably because we're not, we're not experiencing peace with God. It's got to be. John declared Jesus the sacrificial lamb, and he's the scapegoat. Takes away the sin of the world. You know, our, our early church fathers, they, they, I mean, they, they so appreciated that thought that we look at, well, you know, this is the, 20, this is the year 2022. You know, we're more sophisticated. No, we're not. Our, our faith is built upon nothing less than, than, than the blood of Christ in that sense. Okay? But our early brothers and sisters in Christ, I mean, when you look in the book of Acts and you see that story there about, you know, Philip as he's riding along and the angel says, you need to go over and talk to this guy, the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch is reading that scroll of the book of Isaiah. And, and Philip looks at him and says, do you understand what you're reading? And then the guy says, how can I unless somebody speak to me about it or teach me? And he sat down and he talked about the sacrificial lamb. And Isaiah 53, he talked about the this lamb that, that was suffering and was, was able to, to sacrifice himself for us. And this eunuch is converted at that moment he looks out sees a body of water and says see there is water what does hinder me from being baptized you look back in the scripture in first corinthians 5 7 paul stated that christ was our passover and our sacrifice peter first peter chapter 1 verse 18 and 19 he declared christ's redemption his death was precious he declared that we're not redeemed listen to me we're not redeemed by silver and gold we are redeemed by the blood of the lamb Faultless, spotless, and the Lamb is Christ in Christ alone. In Christ alone. In Christ alone. And then in Revelation 5, Christ appears as the Lamb, which bears on its throat the marks of a sacrifice. But listen, he's still alive. And you say, well, what does that mean? That means because he lives, we shall live. You understand what I'm saying? The Lamb that was sacrificed on a hill called Calvary, because he lives, we see him in glory. Because he lives, we shall live. We shall live. It doesn't stop there. Revelation 19, with garments stained by the blood of sacrifice, with sword in the mouth, he rides to victory over every enemy of his cause and his people. Jesus, the Lamb of God, sacrificed for each of us. What a great understanding that we should have with regards to our relationship to God. He did something for us we could not do for ourselves. He gave his life for each of us question might be at this moment, what are we willing to give for him? Abraham took God at his word. He believed that even if Isaac had died that moment, that God would raise him back up. John answered the call. Later he would say, he must increase and I must decrease. John the Revelator said, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, not by my good works. Not by my monetary means, not by my status in society. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. The blood of Christ. Christ alone. Redeemed. The shedding of blood. You see, without the shedding of blood, there's no redemption. No repentance, no redemption. No cross, no crown. Isaac asked the question, where's the lamb? John responded, behold the lamb of God. John the, the beloved said, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is this lamb for you and I to live a life in such a way that it honors him and glorifies him. Because if you're going to sing this song in glory, you need to be tuning up right now. You understand what I'm saying? 
You say, oh, when we get to glory, it's going to be all good, and we're going to sing worthy as the Lamb and praise. I'm going to tell you, you need to be tuning up right now. You need, need to start living a life in such a way that it, that it does glorify Him. Why? Because worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. I said, worthy is the Lamb that was sacrificed for you and for me. Amen? Amen. Worthy is the Lamb. Let's pray together. Lord, I, I thank you for uh, saving us. For doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Thank you, Father, for a movement and your Holy Spirit tugging at our hearts even now. I thank you as we go into this time of decision that, uh, that maybe perhaps we realize and understand that it's okay to come to the altar and pray or to, to spend some time here praying with myself and others. And it's all right for a time of recommitment, public recommitment, as it is also right where we stand. But more than anything else, we just need to get ready because the King's coming, coming in all of His glory. And we're going to shout, and we're going to sing, worthy, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. And we're not just going to shout it, we're going to live it. We'll be like Abraham, we'll take God at His word, take you at your word, and, and trust you even when we don't understand what's happening, but have total faith in you. And we're going to be like John. We're going to be just. We're going to be conscious of the spontaneity of the moment and shout out with regards. There's the Lamb, the Lamb of God. We'll be willing to say He must increase. Speaking of Jesus, we must decrease. And we'll be like old John the Beloved. What a great moment when His eyes were open and He saw you in all of your glory. That He lives. He lives. As you're reminding us, this old world, not our home we all just passing through and until that day come may your grace be sufficient for us all as we are mindful as we sing this hymn of decision Jesus paid it all and all to him we owe and all God's people said Amen
Lord, thank you for bringing us here today just to hear your word. Lord, to be reminded of the fact that you paid it all as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, as we leave this place, may that those words just linger in our hearts. Jesus, you paid it all. And help us to live in that light. And not only live in that light, but share the light with others. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. Be with us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.